please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The well, lot of Main Street where the rupee plunged to its historic low yesterday. The currency ended the day uh, above that 71 odd mark for the first time, weighed down by overseas fund outflows. We have Lata Vengresh early this morning to tell us. Take us through all those details. Hi, Lata. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Nigel. We must not forget the global perspective. Uh, the trade spat uh, triggered by the United States and arguments that it'll scrap the NAFTA had already shaken the world. And yesterday, we got PMI numbers around the world for mm -hmm. the month of August. And it was nothing to write home about. Our own PMI numbers were lower. Much of Asia was lower. Europe, European here and there, there were pockets of uh, slowdown. And that also rattled the markets, which means trade uh, spat is beginning to have an impact on growth. And you know, the typical reaction at such a time, everyone rushes towards the strongest currencies. So everyone rushed towards dollar and towards yen with the result that there was further trouble for EM currencies. And we know that they're already in a spot of bother this entire month of August. So you only needed a match to start a fire. Uh, Argentinian peso came under fresh trouble for its own internal reasons. In spite of raising interest rates to 60%, they found pressure on their currency. The Indonesian rupiah fell even below the lows it saw in the 20. Asian crisis. And Asian crisis is one of the 20. worst nightmare, uh, nightmares for Asian countries. If the uh, uh, currency went even below that, that was a bit of a psychological jar. Uh, it, it is in that context that we have to look at the Indian rupee fall. We had two reasons. The dollar was strengthening and crude also strengthened. It's always a bad combo for India. So it's not as if uh, things went seriously wrong in India. But ever since the July trade deficit, we do have a domestic reason why the rupee had to depreciate. Mm. We were not depreciating only because EM currencies were in trouble. There was a domestic reason, and that is the trade deficit and fears of a higher current account deficit because of uh, uh, trade deficit not coming under control. My sense is today dollar has, you know, from 95.23, it's come to 95.15 or thereabouts. D uh, crude also has come down a few cents. So early morning, there is no need for the rupee to fall further. But we will have to wait. Okay, absolutely, Lata. Thanks very much for that. In fact, staying with this uh, topic, we spoke to Jayesh Mehta, Bank of America, earlier, who is of the view that the fall in the rupee was on the back of local factors, largely the F SEBI's FPI circular, which is also one of the reasons equity markets decline. Let's listen in. It was uh, more led to, uh, I think, uh, the, the SEBI circular, a big swing on the equity side. So we kind of were stabilizing and we were actually hoping, uh, you know, you will mildly appreciate in the next couple of days. Uh, I think, uh, but uh, I think we have a new new thing and a weaker sentiment, we have a new thing. So it all started with, we almost stabilized at 68, 50 and stuff. And then we had Turkey and that got stabilized. And then we had uh, defense and uh, major outflows for the month end. We thought that's over on 31st of August and like, you know, plus the GDP news, which was good, kind of stabilized it. But uh, now we have a new okay. uh, new thing to worry about, right? So we don't know what's happening there. So, okay, so Jayesh, what... Okay, so it's interesting that you're saying that uh, today's fall is not really linked to what's happening globally. So that uh, pressure on account of higher crude prices and the trade tensions, of course, has already been factored in uh, to the markets to a large extent. But now what has driven the rupee lower today is the local factors and largely the FPI circular issued by SEBI, uh, which could have an impact on a significant amount of foreign capital. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, uh, we have been having negative flows uh, year to date. And like uh, if uh, this uh, circular, uh, you know, creates more negative flows, uh, that's what in a weaker sentiment uh, is going to happen. Right. So that's a little bit to worry. But we hope mm. uh, these things get rectified, corrected uh, soon uh, because it's more local factor. All right. Uh, however, Sebi says that it is ridiculous to attribute the fall of the rupee yesterday to the circular that was issued in April 2018. But moving on though, and sticking with the rupee, uh, the topic of the rupee, Maki private uh, equity firm, Warburg Pincus, this Vishal Mahadevya says that the short-term rupee depreciation is not a worry and finds current market volatility an opportunity to invest in India. 
we're not panicking, we're not concerned about the rupee in the short term, but over a longer term, I think it's important we keep our macro fundamentals good and the rupee will behave well. And stronger uh, dollar as well as weaker rupee also augurs well for making some investments. Is that something that you would be looking at then? You know, honestly, we don't look at it that way. Uh, we actually focus on it on a longer term. The rupee will be a slightly depreciating currency, and we factor that into our returns as we look at it. But it never happens in a straight line like anything in investing and in India. So the fact that the rupee is weaker doesn't increase or decrease our excitement about India. We'd like it over time to be stable and driven by good macro policy. Also, Vishal, in your portfolio, you have a lot of listed companies. Now, how does market volatility impact your investment decisions at a time like this? That's a good question because the market has been volatile, particularly for mid-caps. If you think where we invest, where private equity invests, it's typically companies that are growing, mid-size, that are looking to become large-size, hopefully. Um, I think over the next year, you're going to continue to see volatility. It is an election year. Investors have concerns. You have global events taking place. I think it's an opportunity. So if you ask, I am actually looking at this year as an opportunity for companies like us that are willing to be long term, look through the short term volatility and take a positive call on entrepreneurs and companies. And as far as your uh, overall strategy is concerned, uh, what are the factors that would really define your strategy going forward? I think we have always stuck to our knitting of being growth investors and backing very strong entrepreneurs and management teams. I think as you see the companies in India become more discovered, we are seeing more and more entrepreneurs saying we would like to go and start something on our own or buy a platform and build it. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. I think you'll see us investing behind very established entrepreneurs and partnerships and relationships like an Ajay Piramal, like a Sunil Mittal, like people we know really well. Right. But I think you'll also see us investing in next generation companies like a Revigo right. or an Ecom Express mm -hmm. or the platform with Anshuman and Stellar Value Chain Logistics. So I think you're going to see more and more of that and that part of it mm -hmm. is exciting because if you ask me five, ten years ago, there was much less of that happening. Okay, more of that conversation through the entire day, but moving on then, Uber last week announced that one Indian city might make it to the launch of Uber Air in 2020, but in the meanwhile, how is Uber's business on the ground doing literally? Well, CNBC TV 18, Saina Dhengura, uh, caught up with the Uber CEO, Barney Harford, and asked him competition from Ola and other homegrown play players in the rides and food delivery business in India, as well as the paradox of being in investment mode as they head towards an IPO in 2019. India is an incredibly important market for Uber. Uh, Uber's success is deeply tied to India's success and you know, we are making substantial investments and we're committed to making substantial investments uh, in, the, in the Indian market. Uh, we have uh, significant and growing uh, technology centers in both Hyderabad and Bangalore. So Barney, I want to try and understand when you say investments what you mean and I want to put this in the context of uh, all the markets that you're in where you have heavy competition, correct, all across the world. Do, do investments stand for infrastructure, technology, expanding services or does investments, uh, just a quasi term for a highly valued company like yours, mean cash burn? putting money into subsidizing rides for people like myself or giving incentives to drivers to bring more and more of them onto your platform? So the investments that we're making across Uber you know, are across many, many areas. We're making substantial investments in the technology uh, that powers the platform. Uh, and we have technology centers around the world, including uh, in India. Uh, we're also making investments in uh, acquisition of new riders, new drivers, new restaurants, new couriers, uh, and new eaters across our core rides and Uber Eats businesses. Uh, and then as part of that, yes, uh, as we expand into new markets, into new cities, uh, we're looking to generate trial of the service. Uh, and so uh, in some of those instances, we'll, 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 we'll be providing you know, attractive promotions to encourage people to try our services for the first time. All right. Are there any cities in India that are profitable? 
We've, uh, we've not broken out the broken. city level profitability uh, of, of our business, but it's fair to say that, that, that across India we're making substantial investments, okay. uh, but we're also very pleased with the success that we're achieving. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at our Uber Eats business specifically, uh, we've talked about how the Asia Pacific region is the fastest growing part of our business, and within Asia Pacific, India is the fastest growing country uh, uh, for, Uber uh, for Uber Eats around the world. So we're very excited about the growth opportunity. Okay, so to wind up this conversation around India, I must ask you about uh, Ola, a homegrown player actually expanding globally. So they're looking to launch in London sometime end of the year. Meanwhile, they've already over the last year expanded to about four odd cities in Australia. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're seeing this development and what does uh, increasing competition for you in a market like Australia spell? So I think we're very excited about the Australian market. It's a market that we've been operating in for, for many years. Uh, we've built up a highly uh, reliable service uh, and a strong level of brand, brand awareness and recognition. Let's take this conversation then at a global level and I'm going to read out uh, some of the data points from your Q2 uh, numbers that you put out. So loss stood at 891 million. Uh, down from about a billion last year. Your gross bookings were $12 billion, up 41% year on year. But your revenues are just at about $2.7 billion. So I'm just trying to grapple with these numbers here. So 10 billion odd numbers is what it takes uh, to run Uber operations? As we think about the financial performance of the, yeah. of the company, I'm very proud of the fact that across the rides and the each business, uh, we are contribution positive. And we have been uh, for, for several quarters now. Uh, so, as a company, we're making uh, some significant investments in core technology, okay. in what we're doing with Uber Elevate, what we're doing with our, our autonomous uh, driving uh, technology development. But our core rides and each business around the world uh, is contribution positive, uh, and it's 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 achieving that level of contribution uh, positiveness uh, while at the same time growing substantially get talking about the commodity, especially the currency space. We have Manisha Gupta joining in to apprise us of all the cues she's tracking. Manisha, morning. Morning, and thank you so much for that. We're starting with the currency first, and we have seen the U.S. dollar steady, but that really has been putting pressure on many of the emerging market currencies. With all-time lows on the rupee, with 11% of decline in this year, it clearly has been the worst Asian performer. And the global cues are not so uh, you know, positive again today in the morning because we are looking at the crude oil prices holding around that $78 per barrel mark. It's a one-month high for crude. And the kind of reports that you have seen come in from Barclays, BNP Paribas, etc., continue to reiterate that you are looking at crude oil prices inching higher from here. $80 a barrel that most banks are now talking about in terms of crude. Well, we have been tackling a lot of supply concerns for crude. Add to that, uh, the couple of Gulf of Mexico platforms now are being evacuated as Hurricane Gordon uh, is approaching that area. So, uh, you know, even as uh, we have seen supply concerns coming in from OPEC, the Iran sanctions has been yet another factor which has been supporting prices. The weather, the hurricanes now would add further premium to prices is what markets are preparing for. So some more gains in case of crude oil prices is what you could see perhaps in this week. Okay, all right, Manisha, thanks so much uh, for that. Well, Brent crude prices above $78 per barrel. The rupee more than 71 uh, to the dollar. Not very, very good news in terms of our fiscal deficit. But let's give you some stocks that you can focus on today. Sonal joins in bright and early to tell us uh, that list. Hey, Sonal, morning. Good morning, Nigel. Well, I'll start with VST Tillers. That stock will be in focus because it has reported its monthly uh, tractor and tiller sales. For power tillers, the sales have come in at 1,646 uh, tillers versus 1,628 on a YY basis. However, a sharp decline in, uh, is seen in the tractor sale that have almost halved to around 517 tractors. Hotel Leela Ventures will also be in focus as it has clarified on media reports that the company is in coordination with GM Financial to sell off some of its non-monetary assets and also for some monetization. The, the company says that it is in discussion with three to four investors and Brookfield is one of them but nothing is finalized as yet in terms of uh, sale of non uh, sale and monetization of non-core assets. Idea Cellular will be in focus because the board has al uh, allocated around NCDs for 1500 crore rupees. Persistent Systems that will be in focus because one of the subsidiary companies has made an acquisition. They have bought Haral Technologies that is a startup in the US and the, uh, and the enterprise value is very minuscule 
rescued is around 5.2 million dollars that equals around 38 crore rupees and the uh, revenues that the company that the startup made in FI18 was around 65000 dollars uh, NHPC will also be in focus because company has signed and uh, assigned a memorandum of understanding with Bale for consultancy and joint cooperation in hydroelectric projects and it is uh, valid for a period of 3 years so all these stocks will be in focus today back to you Okay, all right, Sonal. Thanks very much for that. Well, moving on to our bullseye corner this week. Our contestants this week are Pankaj Jain, Ruchit Jain and Vishal Malkan who are battling it out for the strongest portfolio. Let's listen in to their picks for day two of the week. My first call is buy a call on Albert uh, David. We stopped off at 697, target price of 765. Second is long call on GHCL. We stop loss at 255. Target price of 269. Third is long call on West Coast paper with stop loss at 365. Target price of 387. Fourth and final is buy call on Orient Electric with stop loss at 167. Target price of 183. My first pick today is a buy call in CESC which stop loss below 984 for target of 1075. My second pick is a buy call in Divan Housing with stop loss below 657 for target around 712. My third call is a buy call in NCC with stop loss below 97.80 for target around 112. And my last call is a sell call in Just Dial with stop loss above 555 for target around 513. Lupin buy with a stop of 930 for targets of 990. Syndicate Bank sell with a stop of 42 for targets of 39. Tata Motors sell with a stop of 275 for targets of 255. Okay, well, and his last pick is also a sell call on Reliance Infra with a target of 445 and a stop loss at 480. Okay, but moving on now, we have Nigel who joins in with all the cues in the FNO space. Nigel? Well, you know, Ektai, we were pointing this out yesterday as well in terms of uh, the, uh, the data. At the start of the September series, if you compare it with the February series, a lot of similarities. One is that the contract is very, very heavy. You know, close to around two and a half crore shares uh, or thereabouts is the total open interest on the Nifty futures. And not just that, the FIs as well, you know, their total, uh, total long positions on the index at the start of the series was at around 64% approximately. The last time I remember when there was so much net long, was in the February series. And we know what happened in the February series. Uh, the Nifty ended down with a cut of around 600 points. Also. That's just a data point that we put up for you yesterday. Going back to yesterday's data points, well, we ended virtually at the low point of the day. Last 90 minutes, aggressive selling. But uh, the institutional data suggested, yes, the FIs were sellers to the tune of around 560 crores uh, approximately. So net institution selling was the reason that we saw uh, the uh, markets end lower. But I was looking at the derivatives data. And yes, there was close to around 400 crores in terms of selling on the index futures. They added shots to the tune of around 4,500 short contracts. But that's not the point. The point is that in the earlier trading session, they added close to around 15,000 contracts. So you put both those two data points together. The FIs in the last two trading sessions, they have added 20,000 short contracts. And that's why the FI short positions from being roughly at around 35%, now it's moved to around 41%. So they've added in terms of the short positions. They're net long though on the index, but those long positions have come down as well. In the options data, there was big buying out there. They were buying calls as well as puts. They bought more puts than calls, in fact, in yesterday's trading session. So in case things go wrong, at least they have some cushion on the downside. I would say that is not such a bad uh, thing. In terms of the writing, well, they wrote closer on two calls for one put. Uh, you know, that's telling you that, in fact, they don't believe that we're going to get up and running or we're going to be uh, uh, running away towards that 11,900 odd mark. Looks like we're going to be, it's going to be a slow grind if at all we get up and going because they're writing calls as well. And if you're looking at some cues, the PCR is something we look at very, very closely. When it goes to around 1.75, 1.8, then we see the index pull back. Now it's come down to sub that 1.5 odd level. So that's another technical factor you should keep your eye out on. Levels you're looking at, the maximum open interest is at around 11,600 put. So on the downside, you'll be looking at that level. On the upside, 10,800 call is the level you're looking at. So those are the two pillars really for the markets. The 11,600 put though, Ekta, that's going to be very, very important. The bulls will be looking at that very, very closely because that's adding open interest. In fact, it has the highest open interest. So the writers of that particular strike, their stop loss comes in at around the 11,500, 11,530 odd levels, depending on when they were writing this particular strike. So bulls look to defend the 11,500 mark. If they can do that, 
they'll feel well. They're still in there with a very, very strong uh, chance. But today is very, very important because after such a big sell-off, let's see whether or not some of those bounces are sold in.